area makes people better activists. Uh, about 20 years ago, Liza Featherstone, Christian Parenti, and I wrote a piece about activistism or neologism for the belief that uh, the goal of activism, activism is just the production of more activists. We saw this as an anti-intellectual and counterproductive tendency that led to serious confusion about the structures of power, our goals in challenging them, and the kind of society we're trying to create. Uh, I'm going to drop a link to the, um, that piece in the, to the chat. Um, but of course. Read it later, not now. Uh, there we go. And it was written uh, in a very different time for a very different left, one that was small and weak, and while we're not on the verge of taking power anytime soon, we are a much stronger formation now. We think political education has a lot to contribute to making it even stronger. It's not just about making better activists. It's also about creating a living internal culture of DSA. It builds our ties to each other and our self-confidence in the struggle. So I invite you to look at the rest of this semester's offerings. It's kind of funny how we're all still under the sway of the academic calendar, even those of us who haven't been in the school in a long time. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Jeremy Cohen. Jeremy is a co-founder of NYU's YDSA chapter and also of this night school. He knocks on lots of doors, co-founded a tenant organization, and has written on queer socialism and Herbert Marcuse. His day job is as a professor of, at the school of school. Of, his day job is as a professor at the School of Visual Arts, where he teaches social theory, politics, and art. And I should say that aside from co-founding Night School, Jeremy has, has been a leader in planning this and other activities of our political education committee. He's just been elected as co-chair of the New York City chapter. So he'll be pulling back from his tasks here and we're gonna miss him a lot, but we do have him tonight. Here's Jeremy Cohn to tell us why we should all be socialists, though I suspect a lot of us are already. Uh, thank you, Doug and Carrington for those uh, warm introductions. Um, so as uh, Doug and Carrington said, I'm Jeremy and I, you know, feel honored and excited to be kicking off night school this year with kind of our most big picture class. Um, what is democratic socialism? Uh, a lot of what we do over the course of uh, the various weeks is kind of hone in on issues of importance to socialists, um, including uh, kind of how to analyze capitalism, um, the relationship between race and class, especially in the US, um, what role social movements play in social change uh, to things that's those are the kinds of questions we ask in the fall, then in the winter we ask kind of questions related to some of our campaigns like um, climate change and the Green New Deal or like healthcare and Medicare for all. Um, but we do like to start with kind of big picture things and I think there are a number of reasons why it's worth starting with the big picture stuff. Um, Doug I think already pointed out uh, lacking a kind of compass um, and, and that helps guide us um, as to where we're going, lacking a kind of common vocabulary of our values and what we prioritize, lacking common analytical tools for us to be able to think strategically together um, makes us weaker. And the weaker we are, the stronger the capitalists are. Um, so uh, I think it's important in that level also, I think, you know, one thing I'm kind of going to come to this maybe more towards the end, but I think as socialists, um, we are committed to the idea that there are a lot of convincible people in this society as to our values, as to our um, ideas about solidarity and organization, um, as to uh, the kind of future we imagine and some of the steps along the way to get there. And so refining our own thinking our own ability to articulate um, kind of what socialism is about matters because we're not just doing this um, for, you know, we're, we're aiming to ever expand um, our movement. We're not just doing this for a few of us to feel kind of morally in the right because we came to socialist conclusions when we were, uh, you know, 18 or um, maybe I know with the Zoomers these days, maybe when you're like 11 or something, um, but uh, the, you know, to come to conclusions that we're able to articulate um, to a skeptical, perhaps, audience, but an audience that, um, and, a, you know, other struggling people in the world who potentially could be won over to our side. Um, so I think that is one reason why I think it's worth, like, tarrying on the big picture stuff. So with that, by way of kind of beginning, 
Um, let me just say a few things about those big picture stuff. Uh, however rough and a bit uh, sort of notes this might come together. I'm not, I'm afraid, quite uh, at Albert Einstein or Marx's levels or uh, so, you know, excited that those were the readings, but also intimidated by being in that, that company. I will touch on them and on AOC um, as well and some of her remarks a little bit in the course of this, but you know, as always at night school, we don't require um, that you do the reading. We strongly encourage it because it makes the discussions deeper. And so I'll touch on some of that. Feel free to bring it up in discussion uh, later. So it seems to me that, you know, if you're starting the question on what is democratic socialism, it's worth, so we've talked a little bit about why it's worth asking the question. Um, another thing is who are the kind of people that ask that question and what leads them to ask that question. And to me, it seems like people become uh, socialists largely out of a sense that something is deeply wrong, um, that something is missing in this society. And it's not particularly hard to come up with a list of what those things are. Um, we you know, see poverty amidst plenty, um, millions of people, uh, I believe one to two million people in the United States that live on less than a dollar a day, um, let alone internationally, the kind of inequality that we see uh, amidst also people accumulating wealth and fortunes that are allowing them to imagine that they can leave the planet entirely. What kind of a world <laughs> is that where those th two things coexist? How could that be? Uh, I think, you know, if we wanna go longer on, or farther on our list of horrors, we have um, a climate disaster whose impacts we are already reeling from. It used to be, we talked about climate change as this kind of thing in the future that we had to be scared of, that it was coming. Now it's here. And just this last summer alone, we're experiencing the impacts and yet our society seem frozen, seem unable to take the uh, pretty sizable and transformative steps that would be necessary to transform our energy infrastructure, our transportation, our um, our whole lived and built environment, we seem frozen in the face of the tremendous tasks ahead of us. So, so people become socialists because of that. Um, people become socialists out of a sense that there's a crisis and look, we're in the middle of a global pandemic that's killed in the US alone over 675,000 people. Um, people see something's wrong when they see shaky democracy, not just here, um, but all over the world, the rise of authoritarian movements that seem to be kind of safely perhaps buried in the past, buried in the history textbooks. Oh, that was 1930s, this is now. Um, but actually that are uh, what limited democratic structures that we have are in fact quite endangered and not very stable. Um, what else? What else is wrong with the world that drives people to socialism? Imperial domination and war, a conformist press, gaping racial and class inequalities. And those inequalities are not just sort of statistical facts. We should remember that they have real life consequences um, to the point where, you know, in parts of this country, your life expectancy goes down by 15 years. If you're in the bottom 20% of the income bracket, versus if you're in the top, um, let alone people who have suffered from this pandemic without health insurance or with limited health care, people who have been exposed by the nature of their work and their lack of choices over it to deadly situations. Um, and overall, a society, our society, characterized by tremendous spiritual and material needs. Um, people are driven to socialism because they have a sense that something is deeply wrong. Not to mention nuclear weapons. I mean, I could go on, <laughs> um, but I, I won't go too far on. Um, but so, okay, so people come to socialism because there's a sense that something's deeply wrong. Now I should say, not everyone comes to socialism when they have a sense that things are deeply wrong. Um, what I mentioned earlier about these rising authoritarian movements across the world, other, there are social groups, there are social moments where a sense of suffering, a sense of uh, being upset at the existing order pushes people in quite frightening authoritarian directions. 
to instead of seek solidarity, seek division, instead of seek democracy, seek authoritarianism. Um, so again, the, the kind of stakes of socialism is that people sense that something's wrong, but what people do with the sense that something's wrong is quite indeterminate. Another reason why it matters to discuss why it's worth being a socialist, what democratic socialism is and why it provides a kind of alternative to other quite dangerous reactions to the malaise and crises of our times. Because um, these are dangerous times, these are serious times. Um, we hope maybe they're socialist times. So, okay, so say we're trying to convince people there's a sense of crisis, there's a sense that something is wrong in the world. Um, and we're trying to turn people towards a, a progressive way out of it, as it were, a way that looks forward, not backwards, that looks towards some sort of humane world, not towards an inhumane, uh, violent, destructive one. Then it's incumbent on us to articulate what these humane values are that we believe socialist politics stand for, um, how we have some plausible way of thinking about how the world might reflect our values more. And finally, sort of what our ultimate vision for a better society, a better world looks like. So let me start then with what I take to be kind of some of the core values, core commitments of socialists. Um, I think there are a lot of ways you could divvy this up, but I came up with uh, around five. Um, it seems to me that kind of core value for socialists is equality. Um, equality in a number of senses. Uh, first of all, that every human being has a basic moral equality with one another, that human beings are fundamentally uh, cut from the same cloth and that the divisions between us are artificial, are products of uh, long histories of domination, exploitation, intolerance, uh, violence, um, and that we all have a common stake equally in the future of our species and the future of our planet. Um, this is why socialists are fundamentally opposed to racism, um, to inequalities based on gender, to inequalities based on sexuality, national, nationality, language, age, all the rest, um, because of a basic equality that people share and that being kind of a core deep part of our value system. Moreover, I think that commitment to equality is in part sort of a, a end in itself, but also it, it is related to kind of an analysis um, and maybe I'm shading into the analysis part that I'll get to, but it's related to an analysis of what happens when we don't respect equality, which is basically when people with have uh, undue concentrations of power and resources, they undermine um, the basic consensual aspects of society. Uh, domination power follows the concentration of power uh, and the concentration of wealth. And domination is a fundamental way of undermining other values that we care about. And I'll get to those in a second. But so equality, I think, is both sort of a fundamental end in itself for socialists. And also it's a means to an end. It's a means of securing other kinds of values. Before I get to those other kinds of values, though, something that kind of goes along, I think, with equality as a core value for socialists is democracy. And democracy in a very deep sense. I mean, I guess it's in our name, democratic socialists, but it's worth thinking about like, why do we care about the democratic part of democratic socialism? Um, you know, is this just some Cold War relic where we wanna say like, no, no, we really mean we're not the Soviet Union. Um, or is there a sense in which uh, there is like a deeper commitment socialists have to democracy? And I do think there is. I think the Einstein piece is uh, really good on some of this where Einstein talks about like, you know, why he fundamentally believes that it's not just economic experts who deserve to talk about the future of society. And there being a few reasons for that. One, because economic experts are bound up with the existing system of power. And so oftentimes their expertise is just a way of reinforcing power. But two, also because socialism is fundamentally about human values and there aren't like really experts or non-experts in value. Um, our values, what we strive to do together, the world we strive to create is something that we all have to do together. It's sort of incumbent on all of us to make together. 
Moreover, I think a commitment to democracy is based on, and deep democracy is based on certain kinds of fundamental values that I think, you know, are impulses that socialists just have that, you know, not everybody in this world have, especially not elites in our world. Um, so the idea of just like basic human competence and intelligence that people can generally rule themselves and generally know what's good for them. And generally, if they're given enough information um, and resources, will do things that will be to their own benefit and to the benefit of those around them. Um, and also based on that idea of general human intelligence, uh, that people deserve to have a say in a, decisions that affect them. Um, that, and that includes in various parts of their life. And I'll get more into a, our analysis, why if you have the values of democracy, capitalism is so in many ways very repugnant to those values because the idea that uh, our social arrangements ought to be based on treating each other equally and on general consensual relationships is uh, not characteristic of the way we spend the vast majority of our waking lives, even in a democratic society like the United States, uh, nominally democratic society. I do, I teach a little bit on democracy with my students and I always say, you know, if you're puzzled by certain aspects of America, just stop assuming it's a democracy. And then a lot of things actually make a lot of sense. Um, about what our society is and where it's going. Um, treat it a little more like an oligarchy, but we'll get there. Um, okay, so value number one, equality. Value number two, democracy. Value number three, I think, is solidarity. Again, I think this is a fairly deep commitment on the part of socialists. Um, Einstein, I think, again, has a really nice way of putting this, which is that like uh, we're in this grand cooperative effort, kind of the human species together. Um, nothing we are capable of, our language, our basic necessities, our, the cities we live in, the knowledge we have, nothing would be um, possible without a vast complex network of interdependence and cooperation. And yet we live in a society that constantly infuses the opposite in us, that treats us to see each other as enemies, um, as uh, you know, that there are some winners, some losers, and that's the kind of law of nature as such. Um, I think socialists have to have a, a general belief in that the world works better through cooperation. Doesn't necessarily mean there aren't times where we compete in say elections with one another or uh, in debates and arguments, but we have this general idea that even when we are at odds, we're doing so in the spirit of amicable cooperation, that things um, get better when we cooperate with each other. Um, it again, loops back to our commitment to equality insofar as a commitment to solidarity means that socialists as a core value are opposed to discrimination, prejudice, racism, um, and the rest of the things that divide people in this society. Um, and on a spiritual level, I think the commitment to solidarity comes out of, you know, I, I mentioned um, this idea that, you know, socialists become socialists because something's wrong. And I mentioned like a spiritual crisis. I think, you know, my sense is that partly why solidarity is a value worth having is because there's something deeply missing from many of our lives um, that the society we've created too often atomizes us, separates us, divides us, sets us against each other, um, makes us feel unwanted and uh, disposable. And this is, it's inhumane that anyone should be subject to that, those feelings. And it's, wholly unnecessary insofar as literally we are all making this world work together. We are already cooperating. Um, we just are taught not to see it um, and are taught not to experience it. And again, I think Einstein is so great on that, how this happens from education from a very, very young age. Um, okay, so equality, democracy, solidarity. Um, I also think freedom is an essential value for socialists. This is maybe more like a little controversial. Um, I think socialists should not cede the idea of freedom to the right. Um, sure, Margaret Thatcher and you know Ronald Reagan love to talk about it, and you know uh, various Henry Kissinger loves to talk about it when he's overthrowing Salvador Allende. Um, but uh, ultimately, I think that 
part of why we care, I mentioned already, part of why I think socialists care about equality is because we want people to be living in a free consensual society where they're making decisions about their lives, where they aren't being dominated and told what to do, but in fact that they are, you know, have a say in what happens to them, what happens to their lives. Um, I also think that, you know, we generally, uh, we, ju we just, I'll say, so I think we're committed, socialists should be committed to freedom as a fundamental value, um, but that our idea of freedom is maybe a little different from the freedom of traditional right-wing thought, which tends to reduce itself to the freedom to buy and sell uh, uh, your, yourself if you're a working person or your stock portfolio if you're a rich person. Um, I think our concept of freedom has to be much, much more robust than the establishments, than the bourgeoisies. Um, you know, I think our concept of freedom needs to include the idea that people are only capable of being in consensual and free relationships. And I include this in both our, you know, social, political and work and personal lives. If we have sort of exit options out of those relationships, uh, if we are free to leave, um, it means that our relationships are going to have to rely on consent, not domination. And one of the things that makes us most unfree to leave bad situations, whether it's um, a, an abusive relationship or whether it's uh, a job that makes us work 60 to 80 hours a week, is that we don't have the material resources that would allow us to stand on our own two feet separate from uh, abuses of power. So I think that having an adequate material basis for your life being able to have the resources to be autonomous and independent as a person is like a fundamental beyond freedom of speech, freedom of religion, which I do think also socialists ought to believe in. I think our freedom is a much richer, more many-sided conception that includes in it the freedom to stand on your own two feet in a complex modern society economically, um, which far too few people in the society have. Um, so finally, equality, democracy, solidarity, freedom. And finally, I think, you know, this is a squishier one that I don't have a great word for, but I like to say something like, I don't know, human flourishing, um, that a fundamental value of ours is that like people deserve to be able to develop their potential and that people have like tons of potential. And one of the most tragic, horrifying things about capitalist society is so much uh, of our human possibilities are, uh, are constricted into a very narrow space. Um, people are stunted, people are not allowed to grow. Um, I thought, think in Einstein, uh, the Einstein piece has this great line, um, this crippling of individuals I consider the worst evil of capitalism. And I think it's a great response to the kind of idea that, oh, socialists don't care about the individual, they only care about the collective, that's why they repress individuals, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think that is kind of a, a core value is that people need to be able to flourish. I should say also that obviously one should have a rich sense of flourishing that also clearly includes the kind of basis of our lives, which is like having a nature that we can live in, like having a species that can be alive. Like if we are kind of forced into um, the worst forms of misery, competition, scarcity, hunger by climate change, um, that is hardly a situation of flourishing uh, that I think we can say is a fundamental value for socialists. So, okay, so I said, these are, I think, kind of five core values. And I think the nice thing about trying to reduce these things to values is because I think they're things that a lot of people share intuitively in this society. I don't think you need to convert um, many Americans or many people worldwide to these values, like that it's like a, a new religious system where, you know, I'm going to tell you the truth that you never knew before. Um, so then uh, to be a socialist though, you know, so it's great, we have these values, um, but again, they are widely shared and potentially liberals could share a lot of these values too. I've tried to say that socialists have a deeper conception of a lot of them, but I think also, you know, an analysis and a strategic orientation is very important for socialists to like realize these values in the world, that we have a sense of that there's, the world is not reflective of these values for specific kinds of reasons um, and analysis of why the world isn't that way. And that to achieve these values, we need to have a specific kind of 
uh, orientation, a specific kind of strategic perspective um, on how to transform the world. Um, I don't want to go too far into this because I already am going over time. Um, but I will say that, you know, I think we read the manifesto, Marx's manifesto for this week, and I think it's a classic example of trying to pursue a socialist strategic and political and economic analysis of what stands in the way of human flourishing. You know, he starts with, there's a sense of crisis, things aren't going so well, there's lots of potential, but oy vey, um, things are bad, unemployment and, and catastrophe. Um, and then he's like, you know, thinking about, okay, how does change occur? And he's like, well, change is not going to occur. Things are kept this way. Things that the cause of this crisis is that there is a small group of people at the top, um, call them the bourgeoisie, call them capitalists, call them the 1%. Um, they are the central barrier to uh, social progress and social change. And I do think being a socialist means you're committed to believing that the a very small elite is the central barrier to uh, a world that reflects our values and avoids the crises that we've talked about. Um, so there is a small central group that uh, has extreme amounts of wealth and also makes its living through investment, through and uh, through making money by investing money. Um, and that investment could be sometimes just purely on the stock market, generally kind of trickles down into what is sometimes known as control of the means of production, uh, i.e. that people have, uh, those people control the tools and the factories and the, um, the hospitals and the workplaces and the tech algorithms and the like that keep the rest of us going. Um, so there's a tiny, small group of them. And then there's a big group of working people. And those working people and that investor class, that capitalist class have fundamentally opposed interests. Um, so on the one hand, that small group is what's standing in the way of social progress. On the other hand, there is a fairly large group in society that has an interest in creating that progress. Um, I should say that small group has uh, so much power for many reasons. One, because it just has a lot of resources. Um, two, because it has tremendous power over politics uh, in order to block the common good and in, in for the sake of their private interests. And so I think that like, you know, that's in a sense why this group has so much power and socialists say capitalists are the barrier to progress. And then on the other hand, you have um, a vast majority that has opposed interests. And what do I mean by opposed interests? That they would be better off if capitalists were not getting the things they want. Um, say for instance, uh, racial inequality in our society, if we want a society where there is, aren't such huge gaping gaps, racial wealth gaps, a society where the color of your skin determines so much of your educational trajectory, your health, your lifespan, where you live, um, the kind of work you get, et cetera, uh, that's gonna require a massive redistribution of resources, massive ambitious programs to transform uh, the situation of African-Americans throughout the society. Uh, and and uh, Hispanics and so many other groups that are left out by the dominant groups in the society. And the only way to do that is basically to force rich people to pay up. And so rich people for socialists are a barrier to all sorts of positive social outcomes. Climate change, I think, you know, the connections are maybe fairly opposite, uh, fairly clear, but, you know, that fossil fuel interests stand directly in the way of transitioning away from the things that are warming the globe. And, uh, and as we see in the current debates in the uh, legislature and the national legislature, um, other capitalist interests stand in the way of infrastructure investment, of transforming the built environment, et cetera, et cetera. So the interests of the majority are against those of the minority, but the majority, it's not easy for the majority to take action for the reasons we've already said. So in order to achieve a world where it fits closer to our values, we have to get over the barrier of this elite group. Um, and that requires somehow turning interests of a majority into action. Um, and that turning of interests of the majority into action is hard. It's not easy in part for reasons we've already discussed that people are turned against one another, that they're in constant competition, that there are all sorts of ways that we are divided by the labor market, 
by our political system, by our housing system. Um, so many ways we're divided. And so broadly, you know, in order to uh, turn what we might call like potential energy into kinetic energy um, of the working class, uh, there needs to be massive efforts at organization, at building power, at building solidarity um, that comes out of our general values of solidarity being, being an end in itself, but also in some ways as a means to achieving our goals that only together, um, only as a broad movement uh, that overcomes sec sectional divisions, um, will we be able to achieve some kind of new society. Um, the steps towards that new society uh, I think we can broadly say, you know, what distinguishes democratic socialists is um, more and more public control over the resources of the society. That means public investment, democratic control over the resources of the society, more and more guaranteed social rights for people that allow them to have that kind of deep freedom that we talked about, including the right to health care, um, the right to good paying jobs, the right to uh, child care, the right to elder care, uh, the right to housing, the right to, you could say, a livable planet, um, uh, expand social rights, do so through public control, and ultimately uh, have the public have more and more of a say, uh, perhaps a total say, depends, I'll get in a minute to the like ultimate vision of where things are going down the line, but the public at least have a preponderant control or, or uh, check on where the total social investment of our society is going. Um, so expanding the welfare state, I think is a core part of what democratic socialists do, defending it against its attackers on the right, expanding it in a way that's more robust than uh, liberals will tend to do. So, you know, as we see, I saw a story today that, you know, in the negotiations in the um, Congress, uh, it's looking like the Democrats might um, have to negotiate down, you know, put all sorts of means tests on the uh, child care and college provisions of the reconciliation bill. This is something generally socialists oppose, both because it's not ambitious enough and also because it uh, is makes it complicated to access these programs and also because it tends to divide working people from one another. You know, if you're just above the means test or just below the means test. Um, as well as making these programs vulnerable to attack. So we're more ambitious and more wide ranging and more universalist in our imaginations for the welfare state, but also we imagine some society beyond the welfare state, a society where the public has much more power, um, where democracy has a check on society where people are really not market dependent. Um, and that's where I'll end, um, or my penultimate point is just democratic socialists, if we are characterized by um, you know, our response to a sense of crisis being uh, these sets of values of equality, solidarity, democracy, freedom, flourishing, um, this kind of analysis of why things are the way they are and how we might change them, broadly focused on capitalism, the power of capitalists, and the kind of counterpower of the majority working people if they come together, um, as well as the ways working people can expand their stake in the society. I think finally, we're characterized by some sort of a vision of ultimately where we're going. Now, I think DSA is classically um, a big tent organization. Um, so in some ways we agree most, I think, on the, uh, the what happens 30 days from now, what ha happens three years from now, what happens 10 years from now even. Um, our visions of the future, I actually think are, you know, there are actually several in the organization and different ones. And so for me, what is maybe the most useful, uh, I'm not in a utopia, I, I'm not a utopia generator, though, um, you know, I do like it as an activity too. But I would just say, I think what maybe is most useful is a few kind of broad sets of ideas about what our vision might look like. And then we can get into arguments over the particulars. That's part of the joy of being a socialist. Um, uh, broad sorts of things like, you know, we want a qualitative and thorough human transformation. Um, we want redistribution, um, profound redistribution. There shouldn't be anything like the inequality we see now, but also we want things like um, investment that is democratically responsible, um, democratically controlled. Uh, we want deep democracy at work um, and in our politics and in our, in our workplaces at home. 
never forget that most of us live under tyrannies for most of our working lives. Um, and that we find, you know, even if you have a good paying job, the fact that your boss, you have no say over the conditions of your work, no say over who your boss is, no say over the cooperative effort, no say if you happen to be someone who works in a weapons factory producing things that will destroy the planet, this should be, a, it, it is an offense to human dignity. Um, and I think a future society would, as I think I mentioned, free people from market dependence, um, allow them to have good flourishing lives without having to worry about um, whether they have a job or not, which would give them more power in saying hell no to bad jobs. It would also just generally allow them to live dignified lives. It shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't depend on your income level, whether your child gets decent health care. I was moved by this, um, Ferris Front Forest mentioned this at um, the uh, fundraiser on Saturday night, uh, Saturday night that uh, I think it was her, um, that it, you know, seeing uh, babies treated differently in a, in a maternity ward in a hospital because of their level of insurance, how deeply fucked up and wrong that is and what an offense to human dignity and how that arises from people's market dependence and how we need to fight it. Um, last things on vision, democratic accountability, I think for uh, the people who make decisions, economic decisions in our workplaces and the society. And finally that, you know, inequalities be minimal and they not be, they never translate into politics, whether what exactly, um, what level of equality you're gonna have in a future society, I think is like interesting and a much debated question. I think much, much more than we have now. Certainly I think can all be agreed upon. And also that any inequalities that there might be um, should never translate into political inequalities because all of us have an equal stake in the society and all of us are moral equals and have to be equals in decision-making power over our collective lives. Um, so, okay, so that, is that's my spiel. Um, I did want to end by one thing I'm happy to talk about a little bit. And one thing I think this session might be useful for also is I think, you know, as I said, I think part of the value of doing this is that we become more articulate in expressing our values and ideas and goals to other people when we go to the doors, when we talk to family, when we, because we're trying to build this big wide movement for the reasons I mentioned earlier um, and bring people together. Um, so I do think it's also interesting and perhaps worth doing to just talk about common objections to socialism a little bit too in our discussion. So a thought I had is to just like kind of how to kick off things, um, though I'm happy to answer direct questions as well, is just if people want to write in the chat um, a little bit of like things you hear that people say as to why they're not socialists or why socialism is not good or why socialism is impossible or whatever. And maybe, I mean, I'm happy to take one or two and try to provide a response, but also I thought collectively we could kind of use our brains and use, I hope, what I was able to communicate um, to uh, start thinking through uh, how we respond to these questions and make ourselves just stronger, more articulate socialists together. Um, thank you so much for uh, having me and uh, solidarity. Um, thank you so much, Jeremy. That was really enlightening. Um, I think uh, before we, we go forward with questions and discussion, um, Mia will read the community agreement. Yes, um, Jeremy, let us know if you um, have time to maybe take a few open questions before we have a discussion, but um, thanks for the great talk. I have a lot of good notes that I'm excited to discuss with everyone. Um, and seeing people participating in the chat, which is awesome. And um, I'm sure everyone will be lovely and comradely, but just to go quickly over our community agreements, um, they're pretty simple. Um, so if you would like to ask a question, which I guess if we're doing it in that format, you can type uh, stack into the chat, just like I ju just did, and we can call on you and help facilitate that. Um, for any questions you may have, but please do continue typing your thoughts um, in as well. Um, and try to keep your questions brief if you are like speaking out loud, just to um, be mindful of everyone's time. 
um, and always assume best intent. We're all here to learn. Um, so if anything, you know, sounds off to you, we are here to have a productive discussion. Um, we're all trying to just deepen our knowledge on these topics. Um, and I think that covers most of it. Did I miss anything major, um, Jeremy or Carrington? Okay, sorry. Um, I will <laughs> go back if I remember if I remember any others, but um, let's see. Yeah, I sort of love what people are popping off in the chat. Um, actual like objections to socialism. Yes. So I'm happy to like spitball a little bit, but maybe you know we can just generally if yeah. I mean, one I did want to just point out Ob in the chat included an amazing quote by John Stuart Mill that um, I recommend to everybody. Uh, human nature is not a machine to be built after a model and set to do exactly the work prescribed for it, but a tree which requires to grow and develop itself on all sides, according to the tendency of the inward forces which make it a living thing. Um, I think that's really beautiful. Um, so that I was just recognizing that. But yeah, I think it might be useful to just like take some of the things people are popping off in the chat with. And I'm happy to kind of say quickly something, but maybe just have a general discussion a little bit of how we respond to common objections and maybe bring some of these things to bear. I don't know, is that okay, Mia Carrington? Um, so I thought um, the, uh, aren't people naturally assholes that Steve <laughs> has in there, um, I think is a really good one. Uh, and yeah, kind of curious. Um, maybe someone else wants to take a stab at replying first before I try. Um, the way we do that, by the way, is we generally, uh, sorry, Carrington, Carrington should reply because Carrington's great. Um, also, if you want to get on stack to reply, um, generally in these sessions, we just put stack in the chat, like so, as Mia said. Um, I was actually going to call on Jorge, who responded to you in the affirmative. Um, Jorge? I was being more, mostly joking, but basically, like, I was, even if... Even like, I don't actually believe that people are naturally assholes, but even if you believe that, therefore you must have a system that accounts for that. And therefore that everyone is taken care of given that nature, even, even, even at that point, even if people are naturally assholes, you must have a society that is structured such that everyone is taken care of to control those kind of arguments regardless. Yeah, so. I love that. There's a line, um, I think in the recommended readings, we have the uh, uh, Oscar Wilde's The Soul of Man Under Socialism. If people didn't know, Oscar Wilde was a socialist. Um, and it's a kind of really charming essay, sort of a weird essay, almost like an aesthetes argument for socialism. And one of the things he says is, you know, in capitalist society, uh, how much a person is cared for, especially poor people, relies on, you know, individual charity. And in fact says, oh, the only way, you know, someone's if they happen to be poor is gonna have a home, if they're gonna have food, et cetera, is if we happen to be nice people, if we don't happen to be nice people, well, they're gonna starve. And so he has this funny line where he says, oh, socialism would relieve us of the sordid necessity of, um, uh, of what is it? I think caring for others possibly, uh, but which is you know typical Oscar Wilde kind of tongue in cheek irony stuff. But um, I, I think Jorge's point is exactly that. And I think that's really smart. Do you, um, Jorge, why don't you pick one now and respond to it? Let's, let's, let's make this a little round robin or something. Sure. Um, I think a good one is one that Ashley said, but everyone will be poor into socialism and communism. And I think that one is predicated on like, uh, how a lot of countries that have adopted socialism or have attempted to build socialism have been poor. And so when that is true, that, that, that happens, it's important to also recognize it's like, well, a lot of these countries were poor to begin with. Because if you don't include that kind of historical context, people will forget that. And, uh, but also it's, important to mention that socialism does not necessarily mean everyone is paid the same. That's not what that is. It's everyone's taken care of. 
And that is a very different thing than saying that everyone's paid the same, which is a similar, uh, uh, which is similar, which is what I think a lot of people are kind of getting at when they say that. It's like, a, like oh, everyone, every, you know, the pie is small, so you're going to distribute the pie to everybody. But, but then, like, no, everyone's going to be equally poor. It's like, well, that's not necessarily true. Yeah, exactly, Steve. We don't want to also, we want to get rid of that kind of considering of, like, value in society. Um, I think one other way I respond to this, I agree with all those. I think one other way I tend to respond to this is just, like, you know, when even if we're talking about like advanced capitalist countries like the US or um, like places in Europe or Japan, like when those countries were at their most socialist, i.e. when they you know, had the most rights for working people, the most unionization, the most like they were also at their richest um, and you know, they were also growing very, very fast. So that's not to say that New Deal America or even Sweden, though, you know, I am like a Sweden stan. Um, that's not to say those were democratic socialism, um, but it is to say that like, if we think about a spectrum from like capitalism to socialism, societies that were closer to socialism um, actually did just fine on economic growth. In fact, better than our like newly vicious capitalist societies of the present day. Um, we have someone on stack, David Diaz. Uh, yeah, just um, thank, thank you for, for this initiative. I think it's great. And it's great that DSA is um, doing these uh, political education sessions. Um, completely agree that it, it is fundamental that we, we uh, take the time to discuss these ideas. I was just wondering, uh, one thing I hear is that, you know, with a lot of DSAers, um, the political vision that you just espouse sounds more like what you just mentioned, like more like a return to the 1960s, 1970s, social democratic welfare states like Sweden or Denmark or Scandinavian social democracy, so to speak, as opposed to say a more Marxist oriented uh, socialist model, I guess. Um, and I guess back in the day in the 20th century, I guess the Soviet Union was that model, which as we all know, collapsed. Um, but um, I was just wondering how, uh, how would you respond to people saying, well, this sounds more like a radical liberalism or social liberalism or even an FDR kind of politics. I think Noam Chomsky at some point called Bernie Sanders and he didn't really consider him a democratic socialist, but more of an FDR New Dealer. Um, and so I was just wondering, uh, that's my first question. My second question is, how do you see the role, for example, of political economy specifically? Because I think in, in my view, I think one of the things that differentiate or should differentiate someone with a socialist politics is like a keen understanding of political economy and the role that different, our positions within the, econ the economy oftentimes determines our politics and, 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 and having this materialist view of politics. So that's basically two questions. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to take those directly. Great questions, both of them. I mean, you know, I think there are maybe differing views on in DSA as to how hard the line should be between um, social democracy and democratic socialism. I mean, I think Bernie is like an interesting case because on the one hand, yeah, the things he stands for are like totally normal in any other advanced capitalist country. And it's just like how laggard, how mean, how cruel to working and poor people, the U.S. is that, that um, allows these to seem radical. On the other hand, you know, um, I think Bhaskar Sunkara, the editor of Jacobin, in his book, he refers to Bernie-style politics as like class struggle social democracy, um, a social democracy that emphasizes um, mass movements, that emphasizes um, a strong opposition to the wealthy, the wealthy as being kind of the core obstacle. Uh, to social advance. And that's a kind of social democracy that hasn't been around for a long time. And I think that's why I think it's also kind of complicated because, you know, the people who, the people who built the, the Swedish welfare state were like, were not uh, that like, maybe there's an image of like lame social democrat or something. Like many of them were very Marxist 
and definitely believed that like what they were doing was not the end of the process, like that they were building something that would lead to a next step that would lead to a next step that would lead to a next step. Now, again, what that final vision is, whether it's central planning or whether it's some kind of market socialism, I do think, you know, is, is a debate, I think a live debate on the left these days. So I don't want to come down on it one way or the other. Um, but I would say that, you know, my feeling is what is most important is that you're committed to class struggle and to um, a massive expansion of the rights of working people and to some kind of different society. And I actually think in many ways, um, many of the strains of the socialist tradition have all those things in common, even across like say the great divide of the 20th century, like the you know social Democrat versus communist divide. Um, so that's my own thoughts. Uh, other people might not agree with that take. Um, the other thing on political economy, I totally agree. It's why our next session, which people should come to, is called What is Capitalism and is explicitly devoted to political economy. I tried to like outline that a little bit in um, why, you know, the idea that society is two fundamental classes, the idea that this class division is politically determinative in some deep sense, um, and that, you know, then thinking about how the the details of the classes, for instance, how the working class is divided up amongst itself, um, how that matters for your strategy and your politics. But uh, I totally agree that that should be kind of a core aspect of the like analytical tools that socialists have at their disposal and that are not given to us by our society. And that's like why night school exists. Um, I have, I'm so sorry, I have to go in like three minutes. I'm terribly sorry. Um, but I hope this continues. Um, Carrington, go ahead. Uh, one last person on stack is Jorge. Uh, the only reason I got on stack was also just to kind of uh, elaborate on what Jeremy said with regards to kind of, because I felt that what David said about that the existing Marxist models collapsed. And I don't exactly agree with that question, kind of what you were saying, Jeremy, because like, I think that it's just more of like, what do you mean by Marxist? Because uh, you know, and also, if even if even if you're going by say states that are claimed to be Marxist-Leninist, you know, regardless of what you may have believed them or not, you know, countries like Vietnam and China and Cuba still exist, and they still exist, maintain their models. So, I'm not sure if that's historically accurate. But also, you know, I think also like the Pink Tide in Latin America. I think not entirely all of them, but a good amount of them could be argued are Marxist in character. And so, it it just it more of like kind of a more through, you know, through a parliamentary route than supposed to what occurred previously. So um, regardless is that I think that there is a, a uh, I think it's important to consider what we mean by Marxist here as well. I agree with that. And, and on the other, like on the other side of that too, I think, right, the, the term it's so weighted by like the history of the 20th century, but Marx, you know, um, the wonderful work of like the scholar and political activist Hal Draper, um, which I, you know, if you really want to get deep into Marx, um, he has a multi-volume work on Marxist theory of politics. And one of the things he shows again and again and again, if you look at Marx's political career, is how deeply Marx was devoted to democracy um, with a small d and like thinking about democracy in like very broad, very ambitious ways um, in light of the challenges of his time. But, you know, again, when we think of like what it means to be like a Marxist, what it means to be a socialist, a communist, all the words we use, I think that like deep commitment to democracy is like very deeply baked into certainly Marx's ideas. Um, I, I do have to run, but honestly, I think you all should keep going and go through some more of these objections, especially because I think it's super useful. Um, that's my recommendation. I'm really sorry I do have to run. Uh, got cross scheduled for the evening, but uh, um, thank you so much for being here and for your time. And uh, yeah, viva la night school. <laughs> thank you so much, Jeremy, um, for everything and for tonight. That was very that was very clear. Um, if people want to continue this conversation, we can. If you want to add your name to stack, um, otherwise we can go into breakout rooms um, where we can have just more sort of. Um, smaller discussions and and then we will um meet back in the big zoom um at around 8 20. 
Um, if you want to add your name to Stack, just go ahead in the chat and type Stack. Um, but why don't we just go ahead and call on the red Aaron? You can just start speaking if you unmute yourself first. Hi. Uh, I, I, the only, only question I was going to ask is, you know, what what about just the uh, numbers are really low of socialists in the United States compared to the mainstream political parties like uh, Democrats and Republicans and independents are so, so, so much in number than compared to a socialist. So don't you think it's a maybe a detriment to given, you know, how high the odds are of converting the, you know, the mass, the mass power, you know, populist and in, into uh, democratic socialism? Is, um, is this an like an impediment, just the numbers? Thanks, thanks, Aaron. Doug, do you want to take this one? I'm sorry, I wasn't paying close enough attention to the question. Should I say it again? Uh, uh, yes, please. Try, try it again, Aaron. So, so basically, you know, why be a socialist? What about the, the notion of the numbers are, aren't there? That the, you know, it's almost a fait accompli to try to organize the left. It's hard enough just to win elections as a Democrat, let alone as a Democratic socialist. So, what about the, the notion of the mainstream is just too, and you know, caked into the two-party system to really make a difference in being, uh, uh, you know, more having radical change. Well, you know, the radical change has always been a pretty heavy lift uh, in any society. Uh, I would say just in the practical sense, uh, because of the, uh, the semi-official status of the two-party system, a lot of DSA people uh, who want to run for office have to run as Democrats. It's not because we love the Dem Democratic Party, but it's because we live in a two-party state. Uh, and uh, the electoral laws in this country are kind of unique in the world or close to it in, um, in that favoring of uh, these two established parties, which are just, you know, tweedledee, tweedledum very often, although sometimes the, 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 uh, the differences look quite large. Um, but uh, on the other, the, the broader question, um, I think um, you don't get anywhere in this world unless you make radical demands. Uh, and most people are pretty disengaged in politics and a very well organized minority. Uh, uh, DSA is what, 90, 100,000 members now? Uh, we're in getting big enough really to make a big difference uh, or make an, have an influence. Uh, and uh, the mainstream is utterly bereft of ideas as um, uh, French political philosophers, Alain Biadieu said recently, um, the bourgeoisie is totally lacking in a civilizational project. They've got no idea of um, what to do or how to confront the crises that face us, the social and ecological crises that face us. So, you know, we've got a lot of answers. We've got questions, but we've also got some answers. And, um, I, you know, I don't remember a time uh, since I was a teenager, which was very long ago, when there was such a prominent left socialist movement in the United States. Uh, we have uh, one of the most vigorous lefts in uh, the Northern Hemisphere right now, which is a very strange thing to um, experience. Um, so, you know, we're, uh, we're certainly not about to take power, but we can have an influence. Uh, and um, uh, I, I wouldn't give up on the project. Um, you know, the socialism or barbarism choices still feels more real than ever right now to me. Um, thanks, Doug and Aaron. Um, on stack, we have CJ followed by Mia. CJ? Um, I think that when I hear questions like, um, isn't it hopeless? Is it an accomplished thing already and um, determined? I, 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 at that moment, think, well, that has to be. Um, more central, it, something has to be more central to socialism than what is being cent centralized right now. Um, I think one of the challenges to socialism is that it is seen as a white person's, ha uh, white person's group. And it's such a lie, you know, Che Chavera and then um, uh, Angela Davis, the Black Panthers. I mean, all of this has been done before, but 
we have to watch about the whitewashing of it. And the reason why I uh, associate the whitewashing with um, the, the idea of, is it worth going through the trouble is because there has to be like some level of privilege and un, um, urgent, some, some lack of urgency uh, that would think oh, the numbers are too big and therefore we won't do it. It really centers around people who have other choices to survive in this particular society as it is. And um, I don't know if DSA is ever going to um, confront change or, or, or grow out of this, this, this white culture majority, but I, and I'm not sure that it's necessary that they do or don't because they know there are other groups that are working just fine towards changing society. But I just think it's an opportunity to point out um, that fatalism is a privilege and to, to be more careful and observant about how privilege plays in this movement. Thank you very much for listening. I'm complete. Mm. Um, thank you, CJ. Mia? Um, I was gonna actually raise uh, something about another point someone raised. So maybe we should give a chance if anyone wants to like respond to that or has thoughts related to CJ's comment. I could go. Yeah. Um, so I think what CJ said is totally fair. Um, I'm of the opinion that the most important um, influence on the modern contemporary American left has in terms of like the recent like since the 60s was the Black Panthers Party. And the reason why they were and an aspect the reason I think that is because an aspect of that is that they were so extremely effective in such a short period of time and with such a small amount of people. And I think there's not an accident that it was by, you know, led by black people that, that this was the case. And the reason I mentioned that is because every society is different. The every society that has class is different, but in our society, the people who have been where there is a nexus of the most of the brutal, brutal brutalization of capitalism tends to tends to cohere among the most marginalized in society, and that tends to be people with respect to nationality, whether it be people who are indigenous or people who are undocumented or those who are viewed as other in the sense of you know black people or or Muslim, right? And I think that's something that's really important to consider. Now, what I am saying is not, to, it's not to suggest that say, lived experience gives you this unique insight. What I am saying is that the groups of people who have been affected in this way have a much more clear understanding as to what is, what, how capitalism affects them directly, given the way that they, that the barriers that are in the way that, that their life is structured but also they have much more to gain in a society that is fundamentally restructured. So to kind of the point of what CJ mentioned is that I do think that there is a certain limitation to uh, DSA being as you know, white as it is in terms of how to do that. So the best way to do that, and I think this is a task that's ahead of us in DSA to grow our numbers, to kind of address the question from before of how do we, you know, given the fact that the Democratic Party has 80 million, Republican Party has 70 million people, is that uh, we need to focus is depolitization. Some people are depoliticized; they don't engage in politics, and it's especially, especially prominent. And you know, I know, I know it's the case in the Latino community. I know it's the case in the Black community. You know, it's just be, people are they just don't believe that they can change can happen. And how can you blame them? So you have to make them believe that it's possible. Um, thank you, Jorge. Mia, do you want to go now? Um, yes, but I also see that Lee, um, he sent it as a direct message, so it's not viewable, but um, Lee, you, is your comment related to this discussion? I just don't want to interrupt the flow. Um, yeah. Great. I think so. I mean, I, I think, you know, very interesting to me is that both the Democrats and the Republicans uh, are bankrupt in their ideas and they're constantly discussing the ideas that our movement has thrown up. 
they're discussing Black Lives Matter. They're discussing defund the police. They're discussing uh, um, uh, the, you know, the right to health care, the Green New Deal. These are ideas our little marginal movement put forward in the last two years. And both the Democrats and the Republicans are scrambling to come up with some version they either agree with, disagree with, whatever. They don't have any of their own points. So I think a movement like ours is very important. Um, thank you, Lee. That's an excellent point. Um, Mia, I'm going to keep talking to you, talk to you until you- I'll do it now. I'll talk you now. You might as well do it now. Thanks. Um, yeah, so, okay. I, this is kind of a pivot, so I'm sorry. It's not um, super like a, whatever, smooth transition. But um, I one comment that I really liked from someone back when Jeremy was asking for like common critiques um, against socialism was like, that if we have a socialist society, everything's going to become more bureaucratic, which I just think is hilarious because like my response to that is always like, have you seen the United States today? Like, have you ever tried to like pay a medical bill or like, have you ever tried to like enter an institution of any kind? You have to like go through three different subcontractors and contractors to like do anything or like, you know, um, people like companies use 10 different startups to like outsource every little piece of their operations. It's just insane. And I think that um, it speaks to a larger thing, which is that people oftentimes when they speak against um, systems like socialism, communism, et cetera, oftentimes are describing capitalism to the T. Um, and we see that and it's like this lack of reflection on what our system looks like today or like oftentimes people who don't have direct experience with like those struggles of living under capitalism won't acknowledge how similar it is to those supposed issues they are describing as being an attribute of socialism. Um, so I always just think that's really interesting. There are so many examples that you can point out where people do that. Um, but I guess I'm wondering if people maybe also have other thoughts on it. Obviously, like the kind of dreaded example that people bring up is like kind of the Soviet idea of like these crazy, um, you know, super untransparent institutions. And it's like, well, yes, for sure that existed too. But like, we see that today in our political system, we see that, um, you know, in workplaces, um, in the media, like there's just so many levels to it. Um, so yeah, I guess wondering if other people have thoughts or like examples, um, cause I always find that to be um, ironic. <laughs> Thanks Mia, uh, Jacob. Yeah, I mean, it just occurred to me as you were talking and, and asking for other examples. I mean, one, this is just one example of many that I could give, but um, I think a very powerful example would be the financial sector, which um, plays a very, um, you know, it, it feels like, plays like an almost tyrannical role in people's lives in terms of the, the power it has to shape the economy, and yet it's completely impenetrable. Uh, most a lot of people don't even understand how it works, um, much less do they have the ability to decide what goes on. Um, you know, 2008 seems such like, you know, like a relatively minor crisis compared to what we've been through in the past year. But I don't remember being asked to vote on where the bailout money went. Um, but I mean, the and that's just one of many institutions that are that people recognize as kind of being powerful and important, but they don't seem to, there just doesn't seem to be a way for them to understand how it works or much less exercise any kind of control over how it works. Um, thanks, Jacob. Uh, Doug would like to comment on that. Yes, I, um, sorry, just my camera keeps going on and off. Um, I just want to make a very brief point about finance is that it's so abstract that it seems to have no human agency behind it. So that even though uh, financiers, uh, investors, whatever, have a great deal of influence over public policy through the municipal bond market, 
um, and also how corporations are run through the stock market, they're not seen as such. Uh, and they, they can, they're, they're like absent dictators. They're, they're doing this work and most people can't understand what the mechanisms of action are or the, 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 the society behind it or the, the social structures behind it. Um, you know, at least in the case of the Soviet Union, the nature of the bureaucracy is very apparent to anyone. Um, the nature of our bureaucracy is often very highly abstracted and operates through mechanisms that uh, are often seen as, and uh, the bourgeoisie promotes this view, as forces of nature uh, rather than um, the products of human intention and organization. Um, thank you, Doug. And uh, so no one is on stack right now. If, um, if anyone wants to give any comments or have any sort of ideas, questions, comments on the text, um, now would be the time. Um, I know I'll, I'll just say with the reading the Communist Manifesto, I don't know how many times now, but reading it again, just how it struck me that um, that where he says like the bourgeoisie have um, have no right to <laughs> say sorry that they they just have no business ruling because they they are um, they're like Lee said bankrupt. Um, and I just think like, what can we do? And that's why I'm in, I know that's why I'm in DSA is like, I know I can't do it alone. Um, and so the more people that are involved, um, the better chance we have. Um, so uh, indeed we are up against it. But um, one thing that, the thing that really struck me more than anything is that it's like a, it's like the the ruling elite just have like are winning the war on meaning. Like they've just destroyed everything meaningful in life. Like it, that it's been reduced to like a dollar sign. Um, and I and I just think like that's really worth fighting for. Like um, you know, I just I, you know the people I know who um, you know have kids and they're working two jobs and they get to see their kid for like twenty minutes in the morning and then the kids are asleep when they get home from work and. I mean, just how people are supposed to get any like bit of relationship in our current society. I mean, it's a failure. <laughs> and rather than go down with the ship, like what can we do to save it? Like, I, I, I don't think there's a ready answer, but I think we do need to be united to do it. And so, um, you know, we're gonna ask everyone to join DSA and get your friends to join DSA. And yes, we would like to be every, have every color and class represented. Um, but uh, all we can do is make ourselves available and be as effective as possible. That's all I've got to say. Does anyone want to add anything else? We're going to get to the closing part soon. Jacob. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, maybe kind of a touchy feely add on to that. But I, I mean, in terms of the, the war on meaning and the way that um, the bourgeoisie has kind of stripped um, existence of, of all meaning apart from um, profit seeking, um, which is really just survival for most people. Um, I think that this sort of lack of meaning is part of what is driving the rise of the far right. Um, they're offering a, a meaning in a sense. I mean, it's a perverse and terrifying kind of meaning, but they're offering a community that has, that gives people that, um, gives people meaning to be a part of. And I think part of our work is to offer an alternative form of community that is humane and um, you know, enlightened and progressive and all of those things because uh, capitalism strips us of our sense of community and people can't tolerate uh, living without that sense of meaning and community, so. Yeah. Um... Thank you, Jacob. I know the um, the suicide rates were like off the charts prior to COVID. I, I tried to look them up and I don't believe them really. Like what I'm saying, they, they, apparently they've gone down. I don't know, but um, I, I know even like doctors and things that the, the suicide rate skyrocketed with doctors. And, you know, that should be a meaningful profession and it absolutely is not. They're just dealing with bureaucracy, back to Mia's point. Um, so, so I, yeah, Doug or David, do you want to say comment, final comment? Oh, no, I just uh, put a quote uh, 
of the Communist Manifesto, um, a very famous quote, I think it's in the Communist Manifesto, if I'm not mistaken, I've read it a couple of times. I didn't read it, we read it this time, I just didn't have time, but I think it's like a very it's beautiful image. It's a very beautiful image. The Communist Manifesto, by the way, is such a beautifully written piece, you know, uh, very engaging and so prescient in its analysis. And it's amazing that it was written in 1848 when, you know, capitalism, you know, was in its infancy. It was in, you know, dawning, you know, as it's starting to expand across Western Europe, but like most of the world's population was not under the capital form of, uh, of production. So it's just the, I mean, that book is just, so, or that manifest is so prescient. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, I think it's, I mean, capitalism is definitely a system and particularly the current ver version of neoliberal capital, certainly, I, I mean, I, just want to reiterate what you were saying in the terms of like the dissolution of meaning and the framework of meaning and what we're offered is basically consumerism you know which tends to be vacuous and and empty and at the same time along with the dissolution of meaning we're seeing part of the reason is that you know in many of these places where we're seeing the rise of right-wing politics it this is directly tied i believe with the process of deindustrialization and how in many of these communities, your work was tied to your dignity, right? And, you know, being able to sustain yourself and to traditional notions of like being the breadwinner um, and, you know, traditional notions of masculinity associated with being the breadwinner are, uh, were created under industrial capitalism and then under the current version of like international capital were uh, destabilized. And that's why I believe there's, you know, these, Right wing, <laughs> Cuba, strong right wing support in these communities that have been like deprived of their industrial base. Thanks, David. And um, Doug has one last comment to close this out. Oh, I just want to uh, bring up the fact that the, the Communist Manifesto and elsewhere Marx as well makes a point that capitalism, by having created this immensely productive system, and it's far more productive now than it was then, uh, but also having created a global civilization laid the groundwork for a better world uh, that we could imagine transforming the foundations that capitalism has uh, created into some kind of you know, global socialist utopia in our more imaginative moments. But you know, I, I, I've always thought that's true, but I, you know, as we're just talking now, it makes me think that it's also created a consciousness and a society that's so fragmented and alienated that it's really hard to take advantage of these possibilities. We just sort of resigned and uh, you know, really have find it very difficult to imagine a world beyond the one we live in, which is very unfortunate because we do have these marvelous means that we could house and feed and take care of everyone on earth uh, with what we've got now. Um, but we just can't. We can't think about that and we can't organize it. We can't break um, you know, the fetters of capitalist domination that makes that so difficult, but also we can't break the fetters that have, we've internalized in our heads either. Agreed. Uh, thank you, Doug. Well, I, you know, this has been a great conversation. I hope everyone comes back and joins us for the rest of the semester. We've got a lot to talk about. Um, Unless anyone else wants to go on stack, I'm, we're going to go to uh, closing announcements. Um, our next uh, our next session is two weeks from tonight, um, and it will be with uh, Professor uh, David Cott, um, Professor Emeritus of Economics at UMass Amherst. Um, and the, the session will be on what is capitalism, which we have to know what capitalism is. If we want socialism because that's what we're up against. Um, so other announcements, there's just a few of them. Um, we have the upcoming um, o OC elections are coming up. That means we're, um, oh, I don't have the link for that. Sorry, I thought that, I thought Jeremy was talking about the electoral work, working group. Um, okay, um, there are upcom upcoming OC elections. Uh, maybe check in with MBK to get that link or if anyone can find it while I'm reading the other announcements. Um, Beyond that, we have um, election forums. Um, we had one last night, but there'll be another one tomorrow, um, October 4th. Um, and this is uh, to decide on, um, we'll be interviewing possible candidates that DSA will be, in, or NYC DSA will be endorsing um, for the upcoming, uh, for the next state races. 
Um, and then there will also be a forum. It will be joint uh, Brooklyn and Lomond on Thursday, October 7th. And that one will be a fun one at Verso. It'll be half, you know, it'll be hybrid um, partially at Verso and people can also dial in. I know seating is limited. So if you are interested in that, be sure to um, RCP ASAP. Um, and sorry, that link is so long. I couldn't find a reasonable one. Um, and then uh, find previous recorded sessions at, and recordings of this, uh, recording of this tonight will be there probably by tomorrow um, at this, at New York City DSA YouTube channel. Um, finally, please join DSA and encourage people you know to join DSA because we're the best thing going um, right now in this field. Um, we're the biggest, we're, we're almost 100,000 strong. Um, but we need we need dedicated people and um, we need all the help we can get. So please join DSA and if um, and renew your dues or pay monthly, you know, so you stay How do you stay join? DSA How member. Does join? How does one join? What is it? How does one join? There's a link right there. Okay. Okay. And um, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, well, first, hold on. You can pay chapter dues, which is. Um, chapter dues are great because uh, it's just like a steady monthly income for us. And with um, New York City DSA dues, we are hoping to open not one, but two uh, NYC DSA um, buildings uh, where people will be able to meet in person. And that will be great. Finally, we are North Brooklyn DSA Political Ed. Please feel free to reach out to us about whatever. Um, contact us, there we are. So any other questions, um, Aaron? Yeah, feel free to, you can reach out to me or to MBK Polyad or just go ahead and click that link. Thanks everybody again for joining us and hopefully we'll see you next time. Thanks, Carrington. Okay, have a good night. Thank you for coming everyone.